Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you. It's been a little bit. Um, so it's, it's nice to be able to be back in a space where uh, folks can talk and um, hopefully uh, seek some, some understanding and some learning and some reflection and all those kinds of good humanoid type things. Um, so it's good to see you all and thank you, uh, as Patrick said, for being here. Um, we are grateful. Uh, so we're gonna try to be mindful and honor time. And, um, but, but before we, we get going, um, I, I think that uh, one of the things that I wanted to share was, I know there's, there's been a lot that's happened over the last week and some change for those who are aware. I, I don't know that many people aren't aware, but um, I, I am extremely grateful for um, the, the support and all of the, the, you know, the reaching out that I've, that I've, you know, gotten from folks and I'm grateful for it and thankful for it. Um, I think that um, in some ways, um, unfortunately, bad things um, can be, um, can be turned into good things. And so, again, I wanted to just every space that I go into, because uh, some people are present, some people aren't just, just be, just say, thank you. And I appreciate it um, on a personal level, but more importantly than that, uh, the commit that people have shown to like really being thoughtful and, and um, raising their voices to not be neutral has been uh, really important. And not necessarily for me, but for your young people, our young people uh, in Burlington. And um, I think that that's, that's the messaging that I would want to give um, on that part. So with that, we'll, we'll get going here. I think uh, the first person on tonight's agenda from the home team is Christina Ciccolini. You are the next contestant on Update from the District. And go. Okay, um, Bob, I, I don't, um, we, I don't see the slides. I'm only because I have a, I have a special guest to actually present tonight. Um, while Bob's trying to put up the slide, um, I have, I'd like to introduce you to Elizabeth Mello, who is 1 of our, um, special education and parent advisory councils, which is the CPAC, um, board members. Um, I've asked her to speak about what the CPAC is and what they do. Uh, so it will keep going. There it is. So I'm going to hand over the mic. For Lerva Mike over to Elizabeth. Thanks, Christina. Um, I also want to quickly shout out, I think in the crowd are Becky Norum and Beth Coburn, who are also board members of CPAC. Um, but I don't want to read my slides. I just want to have them out there as a resource. But just to kind of give you the quick um, speech about what CPAC is, um, Christina mentioned we are the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. We are um, Mandated by, mandated by Massachusetts uh, law um, that each district has a CPAC. Um, we are considered a subcommittee of the school committee or a subcommittee of the school committee. Um, we are um, parent caregiver volunt dri driven. Um, we're all volunteers doing this work and kind of what we're doing is um, working with the district. We're advocating on behalf of um, children with disabilities uh, who receive um, services through the district um, and also kind of working um, with, to, to educate parents about the rights of um, available to them and their children um, through special education. Um, slide number two, if you would. So some of the things that um, we're kind of involved in or have been involved in in the last few years, um, we have some um, subcommittees, uh, one that focuses on literacy, another one that has done some work on bullying, um, extended school year. We've been working um, on the uh, school schedule at Marshall Simons Middle School. We have another group interested in 2E work. Um, we host a basic rights um, conference, or I'm sorry, workshop every year. Um, and that's just gives parents um, and any community member who is interested in it um, a little bit of information and um, 
training and the basic rights available to them through special education. Um, we host a meet and greet. Um, we do a special uh, special education teacher or staff recognition award annually. Um, and then we host regular month, almost monthly meetings, business meetings, and then try to um, do what we call like parent chats or support groups about once a month as well. Um, and then there's ways to get in touch with us. There's um, our upcoming meeting schedules for the rest of the year. Um, I'm trying to set up a March um, parent chat to discuss um, the upcoming um, TFM process. Is that what it's called? I, the, the DESI coming in to evaluate yes. the school. Thank you, Christina. Um, and I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, kind of our role within this um, diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess when I look at, like, how do we fall into this or how do we um, participate in this? Um, disability um, impacts everybody or can impact anyone. Um, there doesn't discriminate. Uh, we have, um, you know, we ha it doesn't discriminate by age. It doesn't discriminate by race. Doesn't discriminate whether you're rich or poor. Anyone can be impacted by a disability. Um, the range, you know, you can be moderately or mildly impacted. You can be moderately impacted, or you can be pretty significantly impacted. Um, you know, we have a variation of disabilities. We have health disabilities. We have physical disabilities. You have intellectual disabilities. We have mental health disabilities and social emotional disabilities. Um, and from a perspective of special education, um, and when we look at that or access to education, if you will. Um, historically, this, you know, this country, maybe Western civilization has not been kind necessarily to um, people with disabilities. Uh, I don't, if my, my, my history is correct, we did not um, have laws that protected people with disability. Um, and education until the 1970s. I think Massachusetts was at the forefront of um, making sure that um, children with disability had access to education. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, you know, to me, it's mind blowing that that only happened in the 1970s. Um, but I think while that we've made a lot of progress, there's still plenty of work to be done. Um, Many of our, our kids, um, you know, there's a lot of inter intersectionality um, with children with disability and with other um, marginalized groups. Um, like many of the other marginalized groups, when you um, add poverty to the equation, um, the ultimate, um, you know, turnout is not great. <laughs> If you will, you will. Um, it just is one more thing that kind of puts places them at a just people at a disadvantage. Um, you know, I think for many of us, the parents or caregivers of somebody with a disability um, are, you know, not only does it impact the life of maybe our loved one or our child, um, it impacts our lives. There's an ec economic cost. Um, you know, just within the school system, you know, a lot of times parents um, find the need to hire lawyers and advocates um, to help them navigate the system. Um, you know, you have extra costs for things like therapies or outside evaluations. Um, so, you know, I think from a perspective of, you know, equity, I think oftentimes, you know, we have, in addition to kind of fighting for what we want for our children, which for most of us um, is just we want what most parents we want. We want our children to be happy. We want them to be included. We want them to be valued. Um, you know, one of the uh, training groups I work with in the past, you know, we talk about enviable lives um, for our children. So it doesn't each and every one of us want um, our children to be successful and have a life that is fulfilling to them. And I think um, we think about it maybe a little more off, a little more than other parents do in terms of how do you plan that out? How do you create a vision um, and then fulfill that vision? Um, 
but you know, you know, I sit here as a relatively, um, I don't know, relatively highly educated white woman who knows how to navigate and, um, not every parent or every child is in that same situation where they have somebody who can do that for them. I think that's part of why CPAC is around. Um, and that's what we try to do is try to be a resource, a local resource to parents um, and kind of um, helping them to navigate the waters, if you will. Um, and lastly, our inclusion topic, um, you know, in the 12 years that I've, my kids have been in Burlington, um, there have, you know, I mean, there are still, like I said early on, there's still work to be done. There are still situations or there have been situations in those 12 years where, um, that I know of where children didn't get to go on field trips, didn't get to participate in, um, extracurriculars, didn't get to, you know, they, you know, just different things have happened that I don't know that it's. It's not super intentional, but we're not always considering it. We're not always thinking about it. So, you know, um, and that's, you know, that's some of the work we do as well is trying to remind um, the community that our kids should have access to all the, the life of the school, if you will, um, the academics, the social and um, um, the social opportunities, dances, prom graduation um you know and 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 just being in their community schools um being around their um same age peers or their peer groups uh is important um so i mean ultimately i think our goal as cpac is to wait, raise awareness to um be that voice um and uh you know, let the district know when, when, you know, we're falling short and also collaborate with the district to find ways um, to make improvements and make things better. I think I'm done. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, uh, for, for giving us that, um, that, that overview of, of the purpose of, of CPAC and the, you know, advocacy that, that you do. It's important, obviously, I think um, it's nice to have you here and, uh, you know, to be able to kind of um, have folks hear from you directly. Um, and, and and for those that don't have a, you know, faces to put with names, it, it, that's, you know, an opportunity here as well. We are all on a journey of, of making connections. And as you spoke, uh, finding the intersectionality, I, I am a big fan of, bridges and not silos. And so, you know, I, I think this idea of, you know, who our students are, what they need um, is, is more of the conversation um, and, and less of the, the, the labeling of, and, and, and I say that with the, the utmost respect for neuro, neurodiverse learners. I, I'm speaking from the perspective of oftentimes when folks focus on one, there's a perception that there's someone else is losing. And um, I'm not an advocate or proponent of that. I think that um, all of our students are different. All of our students have different needs. And because we provide needs for a particular populace of students uh, and based on what they need doesn't mean that another populace of students, the intent is for those students to lose. And I think as the adults and the people who are facilitating advocacy, that if we model that and we speak into the space that way, um, you know, we are not, we're not lessening our conviction to the, to the, to, to our, to, to our commit to the, the students that we want to kind of advocate for, but we are in fact growing our commit. And that is a bit of a shift in mindset. So I, I want to, you know, kind of name that. Um, I think what, who we have next here is uh, Miss Chrissy Concession. Um, well, actually, no, I think it's Carrie Lamprey. My apologies. Miss Lamprey, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Um, Bob, can you put the slides back up? All right. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to give uh, just a brief update on um, four, dif and four different areas. Um, so we talk about first family partnerships. 
Um, so for in, in that area, that's a connection to um, what we just heard about the CPAC. Um, we have a complementary group called the LPAC, um, and this is a newly formed group this year. Um, it's an English learner parent advisory council, and the goal of this council is to um, to uh, enhance participation um, and feedback from our families of our English learner and former English learner students. And um, we've had two meetings. This is well, we just had our third meeting on Monday night, and um, I. I believe I see that um, Patty, who is a parent of two students in Fox Hill, is here. Um, we are just forming as a group and just starting to establish uh, some leadership. And I'm excited to be able to introduce you to Patty. Uh, she has uh, stepped up in many different ways uh, to take on some leadership roles. Um, and it's just, she's been an incredible presence and um, voice within the group. So uh, she's gonna give a couple highlights of the meeting that we just had on Monday. Um, Patty, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Um, Excellent, hi, Patty. I, hi, hi, Carrie, and hi, hello, everyone. Nice to see you guys. Um, be nice to me for the next 10 minutes. My heart is pounding, I'm gonna talk about, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to talk about my little exp my few experiences with uh, the LPAC meetings that I just attended recently. Um, it was good, and uh, LPAC definitely it uh, manages to bring up certain topics to reach out to parents as to how they can help um, uh, parents from diverse languages, diverse cultures, and the recent one was themed on reading reading to kids, how to approach kids on uh, uh, attracting them to read. We did have uh, staff from uh, one of the schools and uh, she did give a presentation on um, in what way do they read to kids uh, and in what way, in kind of the language that they use to attract the kids to uh, the, the, the reading skills, to test their reading skills as well. And it was great for like in every school, how do teachers approach kids? It's de it's definitely different. As a parent, I thought probably it's, it's just the same pattern in all three uh, elementary and middle schools and high school. But no, it was it was extremely different. So every level, every uh, uh, every teacher in every level, they have a different way to approach kids for reading, make it interesting for them. Uh, any kind of book, and uh, this, she also kind of gave a presentation as to what kind of book is uh, is to be read out to, what kind of uh, uh, kind of for a, for each uh, grade level, be it a high grade or a low grade or kindergartner, whatever. It was great. It was extremely nice, and we did have um, another staff from uh, the Burlington Library as well. And uh, that person too gave a presentation on what kind of programs, reading programs they had, and uh, what kind of books they do offer, what kind of services they offer, and it it was it was really informative for parents who already are in Burlington, already Burlington parents, and the parents who've moved in uh, uh, recently. Probably they might not be aware of any such programs that the school offers or the town offers or even uh, the library offers. LPAC definitely gives an information for all these parents, new and old, as to how they can approach uh, the school staff or the Burlington Library about any anything they need. And yeah, and to approach whether uh, through the website or directly or emails or whatever they do have. LPAC definitely gets different themes which parents cannot think about. So am I. Uh, that includes me too. <laughs> so it was good. It was very, very informative. And yeah, that's about it. So that was my uh, excellent experience. And it was nice to see so many parents actually wanting to know about uh, uh, what's going on in the town. Well, thank that's you. about it from my end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, we had about 30 families um, with us, and we had over 10 different languages represented in that group. Um, so it was our own little United Nations, and um, very exciting to see. We also had between 10 and 15 of our students there. 
Um, so that was exciting to see students with their families. Um, so thank you, Patty, for giving that update. I also want to give a shout out. Um, I see Martha Simon is with us. Um, she was in attendance as well. So it was wonderful to have support um, from a school committee member. Um, and the presenter that um, that Patty was talking about was Renee Sacco, our, our director of literacy for the district. So we appreciate her spending some extra time um, to, to be there with us. Um, so uh, that was our family partnerships. And then um, just really briefly, I wanted to mention um, the data. So we have been looking at our, our youngest members of our district, our BECC, our Early Childhood Center students. Um, so we are looking to see um, what, what additional supports we can provide for our, our youngest members. Um, and in doing that, um, we've been screening some students just to see where they are in their English language development. And that pie chart that you see there are all the different languages that are presented by our students who are our English learners at the pre-K level. Um, so we have quite a diverse group of students um, among our three, four, and five-year-olds as well. Um, under teaching and learning, um, I not, I'm not sure, Sahar, are you here yet? So I think she was going to be a little late to the meeting, but um, she, uh, I'll share for her. So Sahar um, Musa is one of our ESL teachers at Memorial, and um, she, I was able to, um, to observe her doing a lesson on Ramadan with our first graders, with a group of first graders at Memorial, um, and Sahar shared her own practice of Ramadan. Um, and we talk about windows and mirrors when we talk about um, sharing about cultures with our students. And it was a beautiful example of that where um, there were a few students in the class who celebrated Ramadan themselves. And they were so excited to feel that they had this expertise and that, um, you know, their, their traditions and values um, were being reflected in what the teacher was saying um, and the other students were making connections to that from their own experiences. Um, so it was quite a, an exciting and, and thoughtful first grade conversation. I actually learned so much from it. Um, so I wanted to give a shout out to some of that work um, that Sahar is doing um, in really um, bringing awareness of, of many different traditions and cultures throughout the school. Um, and then finally, the community connections piece that we're working on is um, part of the LPAC meeting. We also had a guest, Jody Levine from Family Access Early Literacy Services, um, and she shared about the free resources that they provide to Burlington families. Um, I had actually been unaware of this, um, but they target uh, preschool kids, and this is not just for English learners. So I say this to any family member out there who has um, sort of younger age, preschool, kindergarten age. Um, they provide free play groups for, um, for your children, and um, they have been doing them online because of COVID, but they're actually looking at doing some outdoor play groups uh, starting this spring summer. And they also provide um, parenting workshops. Um, so again, that's for any family member in Burlington. Um, and then they also help family members connect with community resources. Um, so uh, we're exploring that option as well um, to support some of our families. So those are four different highlights and uh, four different areas that, you know, we try to uh, dig into and, and look at how we can uh, support our families and how we can make sure all our students are successful in school. So thank you all. Can't hear you, Ray. But thank you to Patty um, for your presentation and I uh, hope you'll check out the chat because you're getting some love in the chat for your uh, participation as well. And thanks, Kerry, for uh, getting that LPAC off the ground this year. I really um, love the fact that we're getting so much more parent involvement in our work with our ELs. So thank you so much for doing that. What a, what a gift it is to the district to have their voice. Um, with that, I want to um, pass it off to our next central office team member, uh, Chrissy Concession with a SEL slash mental health update. And Bob, if you can get the next slide up, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Concession. I'm the Director of Mental Health. Just wait for my slide. Um, so I wanted to reshare um, the, the Burlington multi-tiered system of support triangle. Um, we've been working really hard for several years to create a comprehensive mental health system for Burlington Public Schools. Um, and comprehensive meaning that we supply services to all students regardless of what they may need. Um, and when you look at this triangle, know that 
um, kids move up and down the triangle, depending on what's going on in their lives and what services they may need. But you can see again, our tier 1 is, is the, the bottom of the triangle. That's the universal supports that we supply to all students. Um, and this is district wide. So some of these things are specific to elementary. Some are specific to the middle school and the high school. Um, and tier 2 is more of the targeted support. I'm going to talk a little bit more specific about that tonight. Um, and tier 3 is our intensive supports. So our tier 2 social emotional support is targeted. So these are supports that we offer to students who have been identified through a multi. Um, faceted structure or system um, of needing uh, just a little bit of extra support in regards to social, emotional or mental health. Um, and we offer a variety of things. So across the district from K through 12, we offer short term in school counseling. Um, 1 on 1 counseling, this is usually around 4 to 6 weeks. It can be with a school counselor, a school adjustment counselor, a school psych, or 1 of our partnerships. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about our partnerships. We also offer some more targeted SEL instruction. So these are um, typically groups within the K to 5 range um, that target SEL skills that come up as needs. So that might be skills in self management, self advocacy. Um, optimistic thinking, things of that nature. Um, we also offer a variety of different tier two groups. So counseling groups, some of these have been going on for quite a while, especially our groups in K through five. So for a long time in our elementary schools, we've offered tier two um, social groups, friendship groups, groups around anxiety. But this year at both MSMS and BHS, we're actually for the first time offering tier two groups for those two populations. So all of our staff at BHS and MSMS have been trained in two different types of group curriculums, one through our partnership with McLean and one through the trails to wellness, which is a curriculum based off of cognitive behavioral therapy. So we're excited to be launching those. They've been going on this year at um, the high school. We've been offering them for um, two, two groups, ninth and 10th graders and 11th and 12th graders. Um, so they've been, they're on their third round of groups and we're just kicking off our first group at MSMS um, in the next couple of weeks. We had a really positive response from students who were interested and parents who were interested. So we're excited to get that going. Um, we also have a, a really great partnership. We have a wonderful partnership with Burlington Youth and Family Services. We've have had this for years. They've really supported our school systems. Um, they've come in and done presentations at both the, the high school level and the middle school level. They've offered um, some in-school counseling sessions for our, our students. And we have a really nice rapport with them in order to get families um, services outside during in the community. We also have a partnership with Leahy Behavioral Health. It is the Leahy um, in Danvers. So I just want everyone to know that it's not the direct Leahy here, here in town. Unfortunately, that hospital doesn't have adolescent services, but their, their Danvers hospital does. So they do send us a couple of clinicians, um, counselors who come down weekly and meet with students inside the school. Um, and the, the nice thing about those services is that they continue throughout the summer. So the clinicians will continue to work with students um, either in the home or if parents or guardians want to drive up to Danvers to continue with sessions during the summer, that's, that's also an option. This year we made a new partnership with Family Counseling Associates, which is a behavioral health agency here in town. Um, that agency has actually embedded a counselor at all of our elementary schools, meaning that that counselor spends a full day um, at Pine Glen and splits a day between Fox Hill and Memorial, and we're working on getting that counselor actually embedded into Marshall Simons next year and Fox and um, who am I missing? I forget which one. Um, Francis Wyman, thank you. Um, I have a partner sitting next to me <laughs> so he can help me out. Um, so they are seeing students in the school. Um, that's been a huge service this year for, for our elementary age um, kiddos who have needed some more long-term one-on-one counseling or short-term counseling. Um, we also have a partnership with Interface, which is out of William James College, which is a referral service. So any member of the town, regardless of your age from, from birth until till older adult, 
um, any Burlington resident can call this referral service. And what the referral service does is it takes into account your insurance, um, your need, how far you're willing to drive, what's what you're looking for, and they will do the legwork in helping you find um, a service provider with an opening within about a four week time frame at this point. Um, so we have a lot of wonderful partnerships and, and they've been great this year, as I'm sure most of you can imagine. Um, her finding providers has been really a struggle as the pandemic has gone on and social emotional needs have risen. We've also been working this year on updating some of our mental health protocols for the district. So all of the counseling staff district wide have been working together um, on updating our protocols and receiving new training. Um, our goal is so that every student, regardless of where you are in town or which school you are accessing, will have an equitable experience if there is a mental health emergency going on. Um, so we are working hard to provide training and to have a very concise expectation about steps that will need to take place um, if something was going on. Um, we're also really focused on having evidence based practices put into play. Um, that's something in the mental health field that is is really huge. It's it's the goal of having and utilizing techniques with students that have been proven to be effective. So this year we've been very much focusing on getting training for the staff um, around that and seeing if we can implement practices within the school system. So next time I'm going to talk about our more intensive programs on tier three, but I just wanted to focus on tier two tonight. Um, so that's all I have. So thank you everyone. Thanks Chrissy. Um, I see a question in the chat, but I'm not sure exactly when it popped up and it said, can you share that? Nikki, do you mind voicing that um, question? Or if it got answered, Nikki Cadillac had a question. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> sorry, um, I thought Ms. Concession said something about a, like a mental health phone number that is available to everybody in the, the community, but I, I missed the that part of the conversation. I was just wondering if she could share that in the chat. Yes, Nikki, I'll put the interface phone number right in the chat. Oh, thanks so much. No problem. And thanks for the question. All right, Bob, we can keep moving along. And uh, thank you everybody. Thanks to the team for the updates. And if you have other questions, um, of folks that spoke, um, feel free to ask them in the chat or we can, you know, respond to emails at any time. So here we go. All right, so we're gonna get it, get into our, our work now. Um, just wanna review the norms with everybody. If you haven't been here before, um, if you have any questions at the end, please let me know. But uh, please stay engaged as much as possible. We'd love to see your face. Um, we understand people are at home. I'm gonna go drive somewhere to get my daughter at some point. So cameras need to be off, we understand that, but as much as possible, we love to see your face, your reactions. Um, this is a brave space. So expect, accept discomfort and non-closure. And um, brave space means we're gonna take some chances. We might enter into some conversations. We've been tentative about entering and we're gonna make mistakes when we do that. So that's why it's brave and um, we're all here to learn. And speak your truth, address issues, not, uh, not about individuals, um, but when we're talking about things, talk about how you feel and what you believe. So use I statements, please. And again, if there's questions along the way, continue to um, post those in the chat. Next slide. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> so the, the why we are here, this, this slide is, will last throughout uh, this experience. Uh, the, and I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, the ultimate goal of this space is to facilitate collaborative efforts with the school district community to generate systems, policies, and a culture of inclusivity that fosters and embraces difference as an asset and promotes the gifts and values of true belonging. This will have the best opportunity of succeeding if we all participate with the fo focus on what's best for all students and children. We will all need to be willing to listen, learn, and be open to seeking understanding. We will all need to reflect, ask clarifying questions, and at times just be still on our reactions and judgments. Um, this is a foundational piece of any space that's created in a, created in a way that, that is um, intentional about dialogue. So um, I, I just ask that folks really reflect on that 
and understand that that's that's the backbone of 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 what we're trying to do um, here in the space. You can roll it for Bob. All right. So the essential question for tonight. Thanks, Ray. Um, why is it essential to think about one's own identity and its connection to the dynamics of our schools and the greater community? So we referenced there's been stuff happening in the Burlington community. Um, there's been stuff happening in most communities, let's be honest, um, around the country. And so it's really important, I think, for change for me as an individual to think about my identity and how that connects to what I bring into the room as a white man um, in my background and all of that, and it's an ongoing process. So that's what we're asking all of you to do is to think about that essential question as you continue this work tonight and in the future. And I love this picture because um, how deep is the mud depends on who you ask. And we all go through the same stuff, but we have different reactions as one of the things we say in our office a lot or I, the story I'm telling myself, like my story in my head about the experience can be quite different than someone else's. So it's just important again that we use I statements, we continue to reflect on our own backgrounds because um, they really are responsible for how we interpret situations. You can roll it forward, Bob. Uh, so, so the goals, um, I think you got the gist of it, but deepen our, our awareness of self, of self work and self diagnosis as it relates to equity. Um, I think that last visual was was fantastic. I think many of us have seen the the the, the fence with the different crates, and I think the the dogs were were very very cool. Um, exploring and discussing our own identity development over time, um, unpacking internalized oppression, which is a word that like we can come back to, um, and continue to unpack our own biases because we all have them. Feeling agency about knowing and learning what you need to make connections with others. Whether alike, whether the others are alike or different, um, is is always a part of the dialectic space um, around the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, Bob. You can roll it forward. So, so I'm going to pick up here, kind of where we left off last, um, which is now a month ago, right? Was you were folks who were in attendance, and I recognize that everybody here. Um, um, may may have you know some folks may have not received um, the piece um, uh, the, uh, Margaret J Wheatley's piece on willing to be disturbed. Uh, we will forward that out to everybody who's here tonight. So don't fret if you haven't read it, um, and if folks have read it, then that's great. But what I'd like us to do, especially given the essence of time, is really just take a few minutes and read the passage that's on the slide in front of you. Um, and then uh, we're going to jump into some small breakout rooms. Patrick has thrown the, the actual writing, the reading piece, um, and it's maybe two pages. It's not long um, in the chat, but we won't have you read that tonight. If you've read it, then you're going to probably have a little bit more of a, a perspective um, than folks who haven't read it. But for me, um, for Ray, um, the, the, a, a big chunk of the piece that resonated for me and the work that I've been doing in a career and, and most recently here in Burlington uh, that resonates is in front of you. So take a minute and just take a look at it. We're going to just take some, some quiet time. I want everybody to kind of take a look at the, 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 the paragraph in front of you. So, so I'm going to jump back in here. So for me, I, I highlighted this because again, it, it, it lands for me in the work that I do and in, in my own experiences and, and 
the piece, the, the more extended piece, there may be other parts of that piece that land for you. So I want to name that and acknowledge that. But that said, we will work from this, this, this piece that's in front of us. So we're going to jump into some breakout groups. And here's what I want you to do. Patrick, do you mind jump, popping this into the chat for us? What I want you to do in your breakout rooms is think about as you, as you read and digest this, this part in front of you, what do you agree with? Uh, what would you argue? And then what would you question? Um, and it is not a requirement that you meet the threshold of all three. We just offer the three because people can, can show up in their thinking and their schema in lots of different ways. And we think that those three frames uh, give, give you the opportunity, give us the opportunity to capture a wide range of thought. So what would you argue? What would you agree with? Um, what would you question or wonder about as you read uh, this, this piece that's in front of you? Uh, questions about what, what you're going to go do in your breakout rooms. If you have questions, just pop off the chat and ask. I mean, pop off mute and ask. All right. Awesomeness. Uh, Bob, you want to get us into these breakout rooms if you could, my friend? And we're going to go for about, would we say five minutes, Patrick? We're going to go for about five minutes. Okay. Worried your friend struggling but don't know how to reach out? You could say how are you or get a fake tattoo. You could ask with an app if it works for you. You could write him a text or knit him a sweater. If you can't be together, you could write him a letter. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Chat on the game, kick off your flip flops. You can ask on your couch while you binge watch. However, you do it, you gotta ask a friend. And if they don't share, you can ask again. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. There are a lot of ways to reach out to a friend about their mental health. Learn how you can help at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Hey, let's check out this park. Find a great local park or forest near you. Go to discovertheforest.org. So um, two, two, two ways for us to kind of debrief uh, quickly here. One, if you feel comfortable um, unmuting yourself. Uh, Bob, can you see hands raised? Please use the hands raised. And Bob, if you can see folks with hands raised, if they want to share what their conversation uh, and elevate a uh, highlight in their conversation that meant something or was impactful for them, then that would be great. Um, the other option um, is for folks to type, you know, something that, you know, raised was raised or they found insightful um, in the chat. So, you know, one or both ways is, is certainly fine, um, but we'll give a couple of minutes for that. Uh, Bob, you see any hands? Sorry, I was muted, but no, I do not see any hands in the chat right now, or um, I don't see them in participants. So we'll just we'll we'll use good good instructional practice here, and we'll give folks some wait time. You know, some of us are processors. Bob, can you flip back to that that slide with the with the with the paragraph on it, just so folks can have it in front of them? Uh, keep going. Keep going. You're going the wrong way. There you go. Up, oh, back one. Perfect. Back one. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Conti. Allowed for imper imperfection and encouraged con 
continuous learning. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I would just say, I, I think that a lot of the um, misunderstanding comes from people's willingness to dig their heels in and their unwillingness to ask questions. Um, some, I think we often tend to believe that because somebody else has a different opinion or, or viewpoint that ours has to be wrong and that it's a kind of a dichotomy. And I think that's where we get into a lot of trouble. And I really do wish that we could just come with a little bit more curiosity um, when we're engaging in conversations. Thank you so much. I, I would, I agree with you 1000%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bob, you can uh, roll it forward. Thank you all. As, as you think about, you know, th these pieces, please, 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 um, don't hesitate to throw your thoughts in the chat. I think um, you, you're likely going to find that a lot of folks are, are thinking similar things. So um, please feel feel free to to go ahead and do that. Uh, Patrick, are you still here with us? Uh, but he, yeah, he stepped out for a second. Okay, okay. So um, we're going to just go ahead and move forward here. And again, I, I want to honor time. We're approaching the, the eight o'clock hour. Um, and there's a, there's a video in this, this section, uh, Bob, can you get that up? I'm going to go back 1. yes. I think it's back 1 more. Back meaning the opposite direction. Sorry, you don't, you don't want the video. My bad. Yes, we do. We do want the video. Do you see that in front of you right now? We Everybody? do. Okay, yes. All right. And it should be playing. When I worked at Red Lobster, when I worked at, you know, Odd Lot or Alexander's or, you know, the Daily News, I wasn't working my way through stand up. It wasn't like that was my life. It wasn't like a kid working his way through school and they know, okay, when I get out of school, it'll be good. That was my life. If I work at UPS, I'll be really lucky. The day it clicked to me, I went to see a comedian at a Radio City Music Hall, a big famous. I think we lost, we lost audio, Bob. <clears throat> I'm fortunate to come up in the time yeah. I've come up in. I've been able to re the rewards of not only my work, but Rich Pryor's work, Bill Cosby's work, <laughs> Eddie Murphy's work. Eddie Murphy revolutionized acting. No one says that, but he really did. I just remember the way black guys used to act before 48 hours. Before that, black men would, you know, it's very earnest and, you know, I'm representing my race. And Murph kind of just made it, hey, I'm Axel, here's my badge, what's going on? The thing that black culture is missing, it's not the comedian thing. Somebody will be that guy. The real question is, when is one, when are one of these black girls going to get their stry sand on? It's like, yo, I'm really about to set it off. I'm writing a movie, I'm directing a movie, I'm starting a movie. I can't wait to meet her. I can't wait, wait to work with her. You know, I can't wait to, to meet the female, you know, Tyler Perry. That's, that's going to be the next level. In my neighborhood, there's like three, four black people in my neighborhood in Alpine. And okay, it's me, Gary Sheffield, Mary J. Blige, Patrick Ewing. Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, greatest R&B singer of our time, decent comedian. Who lives next to me? What's the white man next to me? He's a dentist. He didn't invent anything. He's just a dentist. That's what America is. My dad used to say this. You can't beat white people at anything. Never. But you can knock them out. Like, if you have six and the white guy has five, he wins. If you're black, you can't let it go to the judge's decision. Because you're going to lose, no matter how bad you beat this man up. 
just when you let Jackie Robinson in baseball, that doesn't mean it's equal. Baseball statistically isn't equal almost until the 70s. And, and you know, and why do I say the 70s? Because that's when you started to see bad black baseball players. The true, true equality is the equality to suck like the white man. That's really Martin Luther King's dream coming true. Is guys sucking. I watch the Oscars. Okay, these are the people that made the good movies. What about the people that made the bad movies? That's most of the industry. I want to be like that. Not that I want to be bad, but I want the license to be bad and come back and learn. Thanks, Buck. Can you get to that slide with those questions? No, I'm gonna go back. And uh, this will be our last uh, breakout section. So jump us in for, for five minutes. And um, what we'll do is what surprised you, what interested you, and what troubled you. And I'll throw that in the chat. Since the moment you were born, I've made a thousand wishes. Wishes for your future in a world that's changing fast. Do play and laugh. Do win and lose. Do it all with confidence, kindness, and strength. And always do your best to remember that no matter what you do in this life, what matters to me is that you keep doing. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. If you're a parent, you've done it all this past year. But the one thing you may not have done is take care of yourself. At Boys Town, we know that a parent's mental health is important too. Visit boystown.org slash stressed out for great self-care tips for parents. You can even download an ebook to guide you and your family through self-care strategies because healthy parents are key to happy families. I, th I, thought, I, got kicked, I thought I got kicked out of the meeting. <laughs> um, so I know we're we're at eight oh nine, and and again I want to honor people's time, but um, uh, I would love to hear uh, from folks if you want to raise your hand or throw throw a thought into the chat. Um, that would be that would be phenomenal, um, based on that 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 conversation that you had, which is based on that video that you just saw, the brief video you just saw. So this is Yvette. I'm just going to go for this. Um, I usually don't <laughs> like to speak, but I'm going to say this. The piece that resonated with me is the license to be bad and to come back. Um, I'm not going to, I don't know, maybe I should share the example um, that I shared during the breakout session. Okay, so just this week, one of my sons came home and he was telling me that um, you know, something happened to him in school, uh, to another kid. And so my son asked the child, did you tell the teacher? And I'll step back and say this, his friend has been with him since kindergarten. And, you know, he, in kindergarten, you're growing, you're learning, and you make mistakes, right? Um, but he, I guess, got that kind of label of being the child is mischievous. So when my son asked him if he mentioned it to the teacher, you know, what happened to him, the child's response was no, because they're not going to, no, the teacher's not going to believe me. So this statement resonates with me, um, and I'm getting a little emotional here, because kids to me, my kids, all kids to me are like babies, right? And they should have that freedom to make mistakes learn and make the mistakes so that they can truly learn from it. 
But when you're in an environment, whether it's home, but I think sometime even more importantly, when you're in school and you're made to feel that you can't make mistakes um, and that, or that you make mistakes and you're gonna be labeled. And that this child is now in fifth grade and he has to carry that with him. Not so he's carried that with him without maybe his parents knowing or even the teachers knowing for five years or six years. It's it's hurtful because these kids, they're kids to me, my kids, they're of 10, but they're babies. And what is that saying about as they grow and learn, you know, when they're, they're 10 now, they're going to be 11, 12. What is that saying to them about making mistakes? and being able to get back up and keep moving forward. So I'll stop there. Uh, first of all, thank you, Yvette, for uh, <clears throat> stepping into your, you know, your own discomfort. Uh, I can appreciate that, that that's difficult, but, but more importantly, or as importantly, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us um, that experience and, and that it is meaningful for you. So we uh, appreciate you for doing that. Um, Chrissy, I think you had your hand raised. Either Chrissy or Bob. Yeah, it was me. We we have all we're having all kinds of WebEx issues over here. Um, so we haven't actually made it into a breakout room. But um one of the things that he was when Chris Rock was talking about his neighborhood and the the people who live in it, and that like it's those four famous black men and then or four famous black people and then a dent a white dentist that lives next to him. Um very surprising and kind of some, something that I hadn't thought about before. So very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for sharing. Appreciate you. Um, you would see any other hands there? Nick, go ahead. Yeah, you know, Ray, uh, what Bob is saying, you know, dovetails into what we were talking about in our breakout session, which was, you know, the, the thing that's still troubling to me um, is the notion of uh, systemic or structural racism, right? In that, you know, um, the system was built in a certain way and then we were all raised in it and now we're all reacting to it, right? Um, and like I was saying in the breakout, you know, I had the opportunity to speak with, uh, you know, the mayor of Revere and uh, the uh, Dr. Barrows, who is their uh, talent and, and cultural uh, director. And, you know, I wanted to share this with everybody is that, you know, she used two words that stuck with me, which was intent and impact. Um, you know, and that even though the intent of what we were doing may not have, you know, we, we may not have intended harm or, you know, malice intent, the impact could still be negative. And it's a huge opportunity for us to take a step back and say, where can we, you know, fix where the intent has gone wrong to now make it a positive impact? Thank you, Nick. That's, that's, a that's, that's so point, pointed and, um, uh, true. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that and sharing your experience. Uh, Patrick Larkin, we got you back, my friend. Go for it. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm in my car. Uh, my daughter's coming home from driver's ed, so I apologize for not having the camera on. But anyway, I, I appreciate, Nick, what you shared. And I just, as a white man in his early 50s, I, I just want to say, like, it, that's what it's all about, those aha moments for me. Um, and to come to the realization too that you can be like a lot of white people like myself i'm like oh i'm a good person i can't be racist but i have unconscious biases and those unconscious biases some of them are racist like we have to get beyond that that whole struggle that a lot of us have that i had and just to acknowledge the fact that that i that you stated that and I, you know you're willing to have a growth mindset that, that's what we engage in this conversation. So unconscious bias is still bias. And the thing I want to say too, because we see this with our kids and we hear it, while we wait and, and um, delay until we're all ready to address this, because people say I'm not ready yet, our kids are suffering daily harm um, in schools and they tell us about it. And we just don't, we, we haven't listened up to this point. Uh, so I think, for me, I just appreciate what you said, and and I, it took a long time for me to get over my guilt for feeling like, oh my God, I'm racist, but what you said about the system, and we've talked about this analogy about, and sorry to talk so long, the fish in the water, like we grew up in this, we're in this water, so the 
we probably shared this before. The fox goes up to the fish and says, how's the water? And the, the fish goes, what water? So another thing that um, I've heard is we don't blame systems. We blame people. We don't blame people. We blame systems. So, but there's also um, the responsibility I feel, and that's why we talked about the brave space and I appreciate so many people jumping into it tonight. We're still going to make our mistakes. We're still going to commit microaggressions, which are aggressions. And because of our unconscious biases, but just as we become aware of them, we see them, we play back what happened. at something we were involved with. We just have to take responsibility. So sorry to uh, dominate the air on that, but I appreciate you stating that. No, 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 don't, 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 uh, don't apologize. Um, I, I think the points that you have elevated are, 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 are essential. Um, and before we close here, um, Christina, you put something in the chat here and I, I'd love to hear you kind of speak into it. You wonder because the data shows this and yeah, uh, so it was it was a conversation that like leaned into um, in in our conversation in my group and um, one of the people in my group had actually like because we got pulled out of our chat so quickly so she didn't hear the rest of my line and so sh she had asked me privately and I didn't realize that it went to everyone so I apologize oh, oh, so that's really what it was no worries, no worries. <laughs> I just didn't want to miss you. No, 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 no. Contributing. Yeah. It was just us finishing our discussion in our chat. So, um, uh, so anybody else want to share as we get towards the to, to the close here? Uh, again, feel free to type in the chat um, <clears throat> or raise your hand, and and we we will acknowledge you. And again, I want to be mindful of time. It's it's we're heading towards the eight twenty mark, and. Um, I also want to name that like tonight was a little bit different in that we 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 started a little bit later. It's been a little bit. We have we have gotten to a nice flow with these sessions and um the update piece is essential for us. Um it is the modeling of of inclusion, um, that part of the work and putting faces to the work and names to the work. And so that's that's really important for us. And then the getting to this conversation is equally important. And I highlight that for one reason. Some of the connectivity here is the balance of this work that we call today diversity, equity, and inclusion in it in and of itself has to be to attack the structural pieces um, while also doing our what we call our self-work, our identity work, our reflection work. Because systems, big systems, uh, have have embedded elements to protect um, themselves or itself um, in that over a period of time systems have impacts and um, we as humanoids react to to systems and then we respond to the conditions because we're, we're wired to avoid harm and so over time if that's happening 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 well, we build up a foundation of of participating as the resistance ourselves the, the the only way to to mitigate some of that is in reflection and then to counteract in our behaviors which is really hard to do um and requires a lot of um of time um in terms of like naming things and talking about things and and more importantly hearing different from others like perspectives and and really challenging our own beliefs and being curious um you know it, it is it is um it has to be intentional and to Patrick's point, you, you know, we will all mess up. We will all make mistakes um, because we're human. Um, but, but we have to own what we do and, um, you know, how we, how we get there is, is anchored to both sides of the row. Um, you know, it's, it's the, it's the looking really hard at systems that marginalize folks <clears throat> wherever that might be. And then together talking about the best ways to undo some of that um, or all of all of that in an instance. Um, and it's hard to do the deconstruction when everybody at the table looks the same. Everybody at the table is from is from one space. Um, because culture is comprised of four elements. But belief, values, language, and behaviors, right? And so we we all have in the last week and some change 
lots of behaviors that we can point to and say, yikes, that's not good culture. Don't like that, right? Um, so in order to deconstruct those things, it's important for us um, to, to be able to recognize the, the things that, that we have to deconstruct and that we are a part of the mess, right? Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll close with this. It's easy to point at the guy running around with a sheet on his head and say he's a racist. Not, that's not hard. And to, and to lay, all the, lay all the responsibility on him and his sheet. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with Jim Crow, you'll, you'll begin to understand that racism is a lot more complicated than that. Uh, to quote my, my superintendent, he, he, he asked this question. He said, I, I don't understand how we can have racism without racist, right? And so um, I, I think it's important for us to be able to name things. I think it's important for us to be able to ask questions you know, in the in the construct of education, we expect young people to come through the door daily and to be curious and to ask questions. We actually grade them when they don't do it. We we measure how much they do it um, or don't do it. You know, in engagement, are we modeling that ourselves? Are we risk taking? Because we want young people to risk take. You know, and so this idea of identity reflection and, and doing our self work while also at the same time. So you fighting with one hand and you building with the other. That's how complicated the work is. So it requires that level of effort. So with that, I, I'll, I'll close there. I really, I appreciate you all for hanging in tonight. It's about 823. Um, we, we will have uh, another, I think we've got two, three more sessions Two, Patrick, two more. April. I think the one we have on the calendar is just May right now, but we would we definitely want to do one in June also. Okay, so I think we've got two left, and um, <clears throat> you know we we will uh, we will continue the, the the work that we're trying to do here, and hopefully this is a space where folks feel comfortable coming and talking and listening and learning, and <clears throat> holding their beliefs and values lightly and not and not judging, but also like really being comfortable asking clarifying questions and contributing and speaking their truth. So thank you all for being here tonight. You know, you know, I appreciate each and every one of you and, uh, you know, feel free to reach out via email or, or, you know, call the office or reach out if you want to talk to me or you have questions about anything that we've, we've kind of shared in this session, something rubbed you wrong. Like, please, please, please don't carry that around. It's not healthy. Um, I, I have pretty thick skin, quite frankly. And, um, I, I, and I like, I'm a willing listener and, you know, sometimes I'll have answers and sometimes I won't, um, but it'll be done with respect and appreciation and gratitude and, and most importantly, humility. So um, there's zero reason to, to not do that. Don't carry it around. It's not productive. It's not useful for our community. It's not useful for you or anybody that loves and cares about you. Um, so with that, thank you. Appreciate you all. And we will see you next time.